This is the 28th video supplement for CIS 351, Grand Valley State University's course on computer organization and assembly language. This video discusses a CPU's word size and register file. So it's finally time to start building a real general purpose CPU. To keep things simple, or at least as simple as possible, we'll start slow and add one feature at a time. Initially, our CPU will only be able to handle basic arithmetic. Statements like x equals y plus z, a equals b and c, and so on. The first thing we need to do, however, is pick a word size. For reasons that will become clear in a minute, most CPUs are designed to work most naturally with data of a specific size. For example, most desktops, laptops, phones today work most naturally with data that's up to 64 bits long. A chunk of data that's the preferred size for a CPU is called a word. So why do we start by choosing a size for the CPU's word? Well, because the Bible says so. Okay, sorry, I couldn't resist the pun. But seriously, the word size affects the most fundamental aspects of the CPU's design. For example, we're going to begin by building a CPU that can only handle arithmetic. But to build the CPU, we need to know how big to make the ALU. For example, how big of numbers are we going to ask it to add in one step? Also, as we'll see soon, the word size often, but not always, determines the width of the registers and the memory bus. To maintain consistency with the textbook, we're going to build a CPU that uses a 32-bit word. At the center of the CPU will be a 32-bit ALU. This is what I mean when I say that the word is the most natural data size. With this design, we can add numbers up to 32 bits in a single step, Whereas if we want to process larger numbers, we need to break the number into pieces and take multiple steps. The next thing we need is a place to store data. When we say x equals y plus z, where do y and z come from? And where do we put x when we're done? For now, we'll simply store data in registers. Remember, a register is just a bunch of flip-flops working in parallel to store multiple bits. Since our ALU expects 32-bit input, it only makes sense that our registers are 32 bits wide. If they were smaller, what would we do with the extra data that comes out of the ALU? If they were bigger, how would we use those extra bits? If the ALU doesn't fill the register up, what will? So this is an example of what I mean when I say the choice of the word size directs other aspects of the CPU's design. So we know we want a 32-bit register, but how many of them do we want? The optimal number isn't obvious. The more you have, the more powerful your CPU is. But registers aren't free. Among other things, they take up limited space on the chip and they consume power. We'll come back and look at this trade-off later in the semester after we've learned more about how the CPU is built. For now, we'll just say that there are 32 registers. Now be careful. This choice of 32 is a bit misleading because it's not a direct consequence of the word size. It's not exactly a coincidence, but the relationship is very indirect. Again, we'll have to wait till later in the semester after we've seen more of the CPU's design before I can effectively explain where this 32 came from. For now, just remember that it's the width of the registers that is tied to the word size, not the number of registers. As I just explained, to work well together, the ALU and the registers should have the same width. But from this perspective, it really doesn't matter how many registers there are. Our CPU's collection of registers is called a register file. Think of it as a big virtual box that holds all the registers. It has several inputs and outputs. The textbook calls the first two inputs A1 and A2. They identify the two registers that contain the data to be used. The registers that will send their data onto the ALU. The corresponding outputs are called RD1 and RD2. They contain the data in the registers that are specified by A1 and A2. Input A3 specifies which register is going to be updated with the results of the arithmetic. And the WD input is what actually contains that value. So let's think about how to implement this. First question, how do we connect the registers specified by A1 and A2 to the corresponding RD1 and RD2 outputs? Perhaps the answer will be more obvious if I rephrase the question this way. How do we select the desired register? Well, of course, we use a MUX. A1 and A2 are simply the selectors for the MUX that routes the data from the desired register to the output. Now notice here that there are two MUXs. 
We say this particular register file is two-ported because the two muxes allow us to read two registers at the same time. After performing the desired calculation, we need to be able to write the result back into the register file. The challenge is to get the data to be written to the correct register in a way that only the desired register is updated. This is a bit tricky. Pause the video and see if you can figure it out. Okay, the first two things to notice are, one, there needs to be a path from the right data input to each register. If any part of this path were missing, there would be at least one register that we couldn't write to. Second, each register needs an additional enable input to specify whether that register should take on a new value. Because the circuit drawn here will simply update all the registers on every clock cycle, and that's not what we want. So let's see if we can figure out how to add an enable input to the flip-flop we developed in a previous video. So here's the abstract flip-flop we've been working with thus far. The additional E input stands for enable. The register should only take on a new value on the rising edge of the clock if E also has a 1 when the clock rises. So pause the video and try to come up with two or three different ways of doing this. So here's a simple but dangerous solution. The idea is that we put an AND gate on the clock. That way, if the enable input is zero, the register never sees the rising edge. But there's a subtle case where this might fail. Can you see it? The problem is that the register's clock input, that is the clock signal that actually enters the register, may rise at the wrong time. The timing diagram below shows three possible situations. On the first rising clock, the enable input is zero. The register's clock input remains zero because the enable zero input into that AND gate produces a zero output. It never rises to one. On the second rising clock edge, the enable input is one, so the register does see the rising edge as desired. The one on the enable into the AND gate means the output is just equal to the clock. The problem comes in if the enable takes on a transient value while the clock is one. If E temporarily dips to zero and then rises back to one, then the output of the AND gate will also dip to zero and rise back to one. Then the register will perceive that changing output from the AND gate as a rising clock edge and potentially accept a new value too early. Now note that this solution will work if E is guaranteed to not have transient values. But do you have any ideas how we could add an enable in a way that isn't susceptible to transient values? So here's a solution. This register accepts a new value on every rising edge. Notice the quotes around new. If enable is 1, then the mux passes through the value currently on D, and that becomes the new value. However, if the enable is 0, then the mux passes through the current value of the register, so it just reloads its current value, effectively holding its current value. By using this feedback system, we avoid the potential problem of transient values on the enable. Also, as a side note, whenever possible, avoid putting logic on the clock. Doing so can lead to several potential complications. We just saw one. Another common one is called clock skew, where the propagation delay of the gates on the clock lead to different components of the CPU seeing the clock signal at different times. When we add this enable technique to our register file, we get this. So now, we just need to turn the A3 input into the correct enable signal for each of the registers. Pause the video and finish the circuit. The key idea here is that the enable input is checking to see if A3 is the binary encoding of the corresponding register number. For example, the enable to R0 is looking to see if A3 is equal to 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. R1 is looking to see if A3 is equal to 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, and so on. We implement this is equal check the same way we do when implementing a mux, by placing a pattern of NOT gates in front of the AND gate such that they represent the desired number in binary. If we apply this pattern to our register file, we get this. Here you can see the part of the circuit that matches the A3 input to the enable of the desired register. 
Normally, when drawing this circuit, these gates would be abstracted away into a sub-circuit called a decoder. Also, the registers would typically be shown with an enabled input instead of explicitly showing the MUX that controls whether D or Q is fed into the register. So now, we have all the details of the first two pieces of a general purpose CPU, the register file and the ALU. When we want to perform an instruction like adding the contents of two registers, we place the numbers of the two source registers on A1 and A2, place the number of the destination register on A3, and place the opcode for, in this case, addition, on the ALU selector. The register file will put the contents of R2 and R3 onto RD1 and RD2. Then the ALU will perform the addition, and when the clock next ticks, register 1 will be enabled for writing and will be updated with the result of the addition. The next two videos will look at where the values for A1, A2, and A3 come from, and how we get them to work together to form a complete program. But for now, make sure you understand that a word is a chunk of data that's the preferred size for a particular CPU, and that the size of the ALU and the width of the registers are usually, but not always, the same as the word size. Also, be able to sketch the register file and how it's implemented, and also be able to explain its operation.